Today's special guest, plain and simply, one of the greatest NHL defensemen of all time, Larry Robinson. Joe Tilly's great Canadian sports show, coming up! Our special guest today hails from Marvelville, Ontario. He played 20 NHL seasons, all playoff appearances. He was a six-time All-Star, a two-time Norris Trophy winner. He won six Stanley Cups as a player, three Stanley Cups as a coach, another as a scout. He is the NHL all-time leader in plus-minus with plus 730. He was a 1978 Conn Smythe Trophy winner. He was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1995. He's a heck of a polo player. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program, Larry Robinson. Larry, great to have you here. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us, Joe. You know, uh, I just finished reading the book, Larry Robinson, The Great Defender, uh, My Hockey Odyssey. It was co-written by Kevin Shea, who's a great friend of the program, good friend of ours, a great author. I want to tell you, great book. Thank so you. Tell me, gr- growing up in Marvelville, Ontario, I looked it up. Uh, it's about a little bit, maybe half an hour or so southeast of Ottawa. Is that pretty close? Yeah. That's pretty close. Yeah. Basically, what it was, Joe, was uh, uh, that's a farming farming country. And um, really, it's, it's not an address. Uh, it's where all the mail came. There was a local post office there. Um, Arnold Park was uh, the owner of the post office and uh, basically the the story is anyway is my grandfather uh, named the area because Marvelville means island and if you uh, leave from where the post office is there's four roads going in each direction and each road has a bridge that in the spring floods so basically in the springtime that whole area is kind of a bit of an island so that's how Marvelville got its name all the bridges flood. Nobody goes anywhere. Marvelville is a place to stay yeah. in the springtime. Is that what you're saying? Well, you did say in the yeah. book that uh, there, uh, the town was so small that you are now leaving Marvelville sign is on the other side of the welcome to Marvelville sign. <laughs> There's, yeah, the, 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 the sign has two sides. One says welcome to Marvelville and the other side of the sign says thank you for coming to Marvelville. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, well, it's funny. Actually, I was, actually, Joe, I was very fortunate um, about uh, – I guess it'd be almost 20 years now. Um, the uh, local town uh, named the, the road that uh, leads beside my house and goes down towards where my, uh, my late brother used to live. Uh, they call that Larry Robinson Road. So it's, it's still up there now. But it, unfortunately, the, somebody uh, ran into the sign the other day and knocked the sign down. So somebody put a hockey stick in and, and, uh, and wrote the Larry Robinson Road where the sign used to be. So, uh, but that's the way it is. Yeah, that sounds very appropriate uh, with a yeah. hockey stick sign for, for Mar- Marvinville. But you're actually born in Winchester, which is where my wife's grandmother was born. So that's uh, you've got something in common with her. Uh, yeah. So tell me, what, uh, how does growing up in, in, a, in a farming community, dairy community uh, like Marvelville shape you as, as a future hockey player? Uh, basically a dozen, really. Um, we had, we, I was involved in a lot of sports. Uh, we had, uh, there was a, a bunch of boys in the, in the area and we all got together, uh, at the local public school and, uh, we kind of made the, uh, ice and the rink ourselves. And then, uh, we would just spend days and days and days skating and shooting around with the puck, but I, I never played, uh, competitive hockey until I was about seven or eight years old. And uh, then I went to the, uh, to Russell, which is, uh, I don't know, about seven or eight miles uh, east of Marbleville. And the, uh, the local uh, Lions club there had, uh, you know, what, whatever it is, like uh, pickup games, they had Pee Wee and Bantam and everything else. It's like a house league. And uh, so I started playing house league down there and uh, I was fortunate enough to have a really, really good uh, coach. His, uh, his name was uh, Bill Linegar. And uh, he, 
he basically taught our young team how to play the game. And uh, we became kind of local celebrities because every tournament that we went in, we won. So uh, we played in that area and we were one of the winningest teams in the history of the, uh, of the area. And uh, later on, in, when we uh, graduated from Pee Wee, we went to Bantam and then played a little bit of junior, uh, junior B. And um, one of the Duncan twins who played for, uh, played along with Brian McFarland, um, for the our Inkman Rockets uh, was our coach there, and my dad was the general manager. So I played a little bit there before I went on to uh, try out for the uh, Cornwall Royals of the, the Central League. Um, but uh, they, uh, well, let's put it this way. I went down there, and after the first practice, they told me to go into the dressing room, and they shaved my head ball. So uh, that was the last practice that I went to. So um, I uh, ended up uh, joining the Brockville Braves uh, and a guy by the name of um, Dan Dexter was the coach then. And I went there as a, actually I played center. So I went there as a forward. He says, yeah, have you ever played defense? And I goes, yeah, I, I played a little bit in Pee Wee. Uh, he said, well, do you want to try it? And I said, well, why, why, why am I not good enough? He goes, no, it's because we only have two defensemen and you're, you're kind of big, so you'll get lots of hockey. And I said, done. So he taught me how to, uh, how to play defense, and then the rest, I guess, is kind of history. Yeah, and you talk about that in the book, too, about how getting lots of ice time when you play defense was kind of nice as well. And you also yeah. mentioned, like, obviously, like a lot of great athletes, you played a lot of different sports. You were a good football player. Your high school hoops team won a championship. And you did mention in the book when you were playing Pee Wee and you're winning lots of tournaments, there was one tournament you lost uh, against a team from uh, Thurso, Quebec, who had a kid on the <laughs> team named Guy Lafleur. <laughs> who yeah, he wasn't too up bad. Against you. He wasn't too bad, uh, who would later yeah. become your teammate. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. pretty awesome. Eventually, you make your way to, to the uh, Kitchener Rangers. Uh, yeah. We actually have a little bit of video from a playoff game between the Rangers and the uh, the Marlies. I think this is actually uh, a game uh, from the playoff series. It was the year after you left you left uh, Kitchener. I think this was from seventy one seventy two, and I think you were there from seventy seventy one uh, the right. previous year. But but about that time, uh, Jeanette, your wife to be, found out she was pregnant, and it sounded like you had to grow up pretty fast. Is that the case? Uh, I had to grow up uh, a lot faster than that. Uh, I found out that she was pregnant uh, my last year of uh, uh, high school. So uh, when I went to Kitchener, basically, I didn't go to school up there. I w worked for Kitchener Beverages, and we lived in the top floor of a, of a house there, uh, one bedroom with a little kitchen and everything else, and um, a big night. Uh, for us was uh, a little bottle of, uh, uh, what was it? What do they call it now? Um, something duck. Cause it's like baby a, duck. a real baby duck. baby duck. That was it. <laughs> Which was, that was our, uh, that was our big night. So uh, we had a tough time, but I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I have a great family and friends and um, my brother-in-law who actually uh, comes down and stays with us in the winter time. He helped us out a lot provided us uh, with a car and, and, uh, and that kind of stuff. And then, of course, we lived with my mom and dad for about a year and a half until I had enough money when I got drafted to uh, buy ourselves a little place. But, uh, yeah, times were, times were tough for the first couple of years. Yes, humble beginnings indeed. And, you know, so many, you know, marriages had happened as a result of having to get married back that back in the day forced marriages if you will uh didn't turn up but you know like one like yours did and uh, i actually have a sister yeah. who got married about back in the in 64 and they're still married so it's pretty pretty cool how how that yeah. worked out uh, you know and obviously humble beginnings but things things worked out all right you got drafted by the Habs yeah. in the second round um Higher than you expected, apparently, but uh, you were sent down to Halifax, like which is the way it was in back in the, in, in the day. It seems to me that yeah. I think everybody got sent down by the Habs in, in that, at that particular time. Uh, how important was getting sent down? Though, how important was being sent down to Halifax in, in terms of your development? Well, that was probably the most most important and one of the main reasons why 
I was able to have the success that I did because again, um, I had a great coach, uh, you know, Claude Ruel was down there and he worked with me every day. And then of course, Al McNeil was the head coach. And, uh, I remember the, I think it was probably after about the first or second exhibition game, he brought me in uh, to his office and he says, here, young man, sit down. He goes, I'm going to tell you something. He said, um, either you're six foot four. And at that time I, I didn't, I, I was still pretty thin. I probably, maybe I was lucky to be 195, maybe, uh, 200 pounds. Uh, but he said, you're big and, uh, you can skate and everything else, but if you don't play mean and you don't, uh, you know, use your size, he said, you'll, you'll never be anything and, and we won't be able to even use you here. So if you don't want to go down to Muskegon, uh, which was the East coast league, um, <clears throat> you know, you'd better start playing physical and, and, uh, you know, mix it up a little bit. So next game I went out and I think I got involved in two or three fights and, uh, you know, I had a goal and maybe an assist or something else. And then my my uh, career just kind of took off. And again, I was fortunate in that um, we had just made a trade. Um, I think it was uh, Bob Murdoch and a couple other guys went to L.A. And uh, uh, Noel Price uh, became a member of our team. And he was my roommate. And basically, Noel and I kind of played on the same line. and he. Uh, mentored me and showed me the ropes and everything else. So these two guys were were just instrumental in my career and, and gave me a chance uh, to prove myself. And uh, so those are the guys that I really have to thank a lot for the career that I had. And it resulted in, in a championship in Halifax right away. You guys won the Calder, yeah. uh, Calder Cup. Uh, we actually have yeah. a clip from, from you after you won the title. There it is. Big oh, wow as a pro from junior hockey in Kitchen in the OHA. And Larry, your improvement over the season was just, just great, looking back to October when the season got underway. How do you feel then about playing your first year in pro hockey? Well, thanks very much, Jerry. Uh, I don't know, I think uh, this is a, a, something that uh, every hockey player dreams of, of coming into the league for the first year and going all the way and uh, having a half-decent year, uh, which I uh, hope I did have. Do you remember that interview? Do you remember the interview? <laughs> I remember the interview. <laughs> it was like yesterday. It's it's unbelievable. I mean, uh, we had such a great team. I mean, <clears throat> when you think about it, I think it was uh, 12 or 14 guys off of that club made an, an NHL club the following year. Uh, so, um, and, and I also remember that we were down in the first series against uh, the Baltimore Clippers, and we came back and... Uh, Michelle Plass was our goaltender at the time, and he stood on his head. He, he played just tremendous. But uh, we, uh, the, we played the, the final game at the Halifax Forum, and uh, the Forum probably holds maybe, what, 52 to 5,500 people, and they announced the attendance that night at 7,200. There were people in the rafters. There were people on the outside. There were everywhere. And it was, for me, I mean, having never played in front of a a big uh, crowd like that. It was, it was a, it was a pretty special thing, but um, at that time you have to believe, we you know, uh, <clears throat> we don't, we get paid until the, what is it? The first week of April and here we are in May. So now I've got to try to figure out how am I going to pay for my last month spent? Um, because I still owed uh, another uh, month's rent. So I had to borrow uh, money from my dad and then when uh, when I got back home from Halifax, I got a job uh, seven to seven with the uh, Department of Highways in, just outside of Ottawa and um, paid my dad back for having to win a Calder Cup. So everything has its price. No playoff bonus. I can't believe it. Yeah, we got to watch. A bad Seiko watch, as a matter of fact. <laughs> yeah, a bad Seiko watch doesn't pay a lot of bills for you, unfortunately. No, it does not. No. <laughs> well, the, the following year, you get called up to the big club. What was it like when you got that call? Well, it was great. It was, again, um, I, you know, I, I figured I had a pretty good uh, training camp, but uh, we had so many defensemen back. I think we were, we were carrying like 8D at the time, and they hadn't made a trade yet. Um, and it just so happened that, uh, there wasn't a place for me, so they sent me back down, and I got called up on the eighth of January. And at that time, I 
think I was fifth or sixth in the league, uh, the American League in scoring it. I had like five goals and 36 assists or something like that. Um, and so uh, Al McNeil called me into his office and here I go, oh no, am I going to get sent down to Muskegon again? What's going on? He goes, no. He said, uh, you're, you're getting the call. Uh, they want you to come up and play with the big club. So I'm, you know, I'm so, he says, well, have you got any, you know, have you got any uh, advice for me? He goes, no, nope. said first shift, just go out and find the first guy that's coming down the, the, the boards and hit him as hard as you can and get yourself into the game. So I said, okay, I'll, yeah, I can do that. So in a way I left the next morning and uh, we were playing against the Minnesota North Stars in, in Montreal. And lo and behold, who was the first guy coming down my side, my first shift that I get? Poor Bobby Nevin, who, you know, wouldn't hurt a flea, is about 189, 190 pounds soaking wet. And I, so the first thing I had in my mind is that I'm going, to, I'm going to hit him. So I went over and I hammered him and he laid on the ice. And, uh, and I got, got my sense. So, you know, then you're, you're pushing and shoving and nine guys are around and everything else. But I said, well, okay, well, I got my got my feet wet and and that's about the only thing I remember about that game the rest was a blur well it's probably good advice I mean you never got sent down again after that it was it was pretty good no. you were there to stay and and yeah. that was just 36 so 36 games in in your first season and you, yeah. you're playing for the Stanley Cup and you win it that's that's not yeah. a bad debut what, what did that feel like uh that was uh, that was awesome and you know and you know the funny thing about it is uh, Joe, because when the playoffs first started, um, we played against the uh, Buffalo Sabres and <clears throat> I was one of the black aces, so-called black aces that, uh, didn't, didn't get to play in the first series. So, uh, Floyd Curry, uh, God bless his soul, uh, worked us, uh, on the days of the game. And you talk about work. I, I'm, I almost, uh, I, I mean, I had to take a nap in the afternoon. He worked us so hard. But I have to thank him because when our time came, which was the following series against the Flyers, uh, we were ready to go. So uh, again, I was fortunate enough, and uh, I think it was my the second my second game back. I played a little bit more, and uh, um, it was in into overtime. I got my first or second shift into overtime, and I was we were going up the ice, and uh, I was going to pass it up to Frank, and Frank said, "No, go with it, go with it." So I took off. And I, I remember just getting over the blue line and I took a slap shot and, uh, on Doug Favell and scored in the top corner for the overtime winner. And uh, I, I mean, back I, I see it back now and I'm jumping around like a crazy fool. But at that time, it was, it was unbelievable. I mean, everybody coming and jumping all over you and even Scotty came running out onto the, onto the ice. So it sure gives you a lot of confidence and gave, it, gave me a, a big lift. and. And again, then we went on to uh, to win the Stanley Cup that year. And uh, I just remember coming back uh, on that the the plane ride uh, because you know we kind of partied a little bit before we left. And poor uh, Lafleur is not a, wasn't a big drinker at the time, and he got so drunk that uh, we had to take Claude Claude Rose, who broke his leg in the first period, take him off the gurney and put flour on there and <laughs> and haul him and haul him through the. Uh, uh doorbell airport, airport. Because there was so many yeah. people yeah <laughs> it was it was it was awesome it was an awesome feeling well it, it sounds like you guys are a pretty tight knit group uh how, yeah. how tight were you well uh you 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 felt worse if if there was a team party and you weren't there uh you felt worse than uh than if you were at the party and got hammered and had to practice the next day that's how close we were uh, I mean, it wasn't, we didn't just stick around just the guys. Um, our wives were close. Uh, our kids were close. Um, everything we, everything we did, we did together. So um, it was as close to a family as I think you could get without, uh, uh, you know, um, going, going overboard, or I, I guess you could say, but uh, I, it was probably one of the main reasons why we had the success that we did. Well, being tight knit like that obviously leads to some some you know getting to know each other pretty good and and yeah. and, uh, and that camaraderie, the chemistry, and everything else that you guys developed. 
You know, I was reading in the book, you, you mentioned that you uh, you played with a shorter stick, and it which surprised me. I always assumed you had a long stick, but maybe it was just because you had the long reach and you, and you, and you, and you were able to make poke checks and, and, and cover guys. But what, yeah, well, yeah, why you, was that? You know, uh, uh, who told me that when I first came, I was playing Jacques Perrier and I had a longer stick and he go, and he told me, he said, listen, uh, you're going to lose a little bit on your shot, but the, it's not how fast your shot is. It's, you know, where your shot is going and you'll be more accurate. But when you're working around the net, a longer stick, you, it gets in the way. So, uh, I didn't, I mean, I shortened it, but I didn't shorten it that much, probably maybe an inch, an inch and a quarter. Uh, but it made a huge, huge difference. I, ha- I also had to change the lie because when you shorten your stick, it changes the lie and everything else. But uh, it certainly uh, helped me a lot because uh, a lot of your work, at least back then, maybe not so much now, uh, a lot of your work was in the corners and around the net. So uh, you needed that stick to poke check and uh, knock pucks or uh, intercept pucks and that kind of stuff. So um, it was Jacques Le Perrier that uh, first told me because he used I, I used to see him and I man don't you isn't your stick really 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 short he goes yeah says I don't need it for my shot I just need it to make the first pass and uh, you know to use it to uh, work around the net and I just find it's a lot better so uh, that's that's how it all came about yeah and other, other players have used uh, you know short sticks through history but you had the natural size advantage and, and of course you, you were able to use that uh, we we have actually. Do you remember this hit that uh, you laid on Bobby Lalonde? Lalonde works to the right side. He's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, Lalonde's list. He was he was listed at five foot five, but I'm pretty sure that was with skates on, and and a distinct yeah. size advantage. <laughs> it was it was played actually a little comical. We had to throw that in there. Uh, <laughs> Poor Bobby. Yeah, yeah. So uh, he's a good you, player. You, he was a good little player, but yeah, you use you use your size and and uh, but you of course you're also known for your defensive abilities, but also your offense. And you talked about having that short stick, being able to score big goals. You scored a lot of big goals twice. You had 19 goals in a season. This is uh, against Elise, a power play. Habs controlling the play, and it a good chance Guy Lafleur is going to get the puck back, and boom, that's an absolute howitzer, top shelf. What a shot yet. 19 goals, as I mentioned, twice, 207 in total. Uh, did, yeah, how much did you work on that shot? Well, we worked on it. I worked on it a lot of, all, every day pretty pretty well because, that, I mean, uh, a lot of times I'd go out with uh, <clears throat> with Lafleur because he wanted to shoot a lot of pucks and all that kind of stuff. So uh, you just you, uh, you, you kind of practice it. But I never really got to use it. All that much. Uh, I, I mean, I played the I played the power play, but when you've got Lafleur and and Shot, well, actually, you, now that I say it, I think Shuddy has probably about uh, thirty or forty of my goals because they were going in, and he'd stick out his stick and deflect it in. And he'd, come <laughs> over, he'd come over and give that little. <laughs> it was going in, but you didn't need him. But uh, yeah, he owes you a few. No question. He owes me. No. He owes me more than a few. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, eventually, and you talked about it too in your book. As time went on, you started shooting the puck lower and lower for those deflections and uh, yeah, know, and get the rebounds and yeah, stuff like that. It, it helped a lot. But you had a lot of points. You had a lot of goals and big ones too. Now, normally, a preseason series doesn't have that much effect on anything that comes about. But tell us about that. The importance of that preseason tilt against the Flyers. It was September 21st, 1975. And uh, you guys had, you know, you wanted to make a point with the Broad Street Bullies, right? They'd come off back-to-back Stanley Cup victories, and you certainly made it here against Dave the Hammer Schultz. Yeah, actually, Joe, this this is, wasn't even a preseason. This one here was a regular season. The, uh, oh, was the it? NHL, yeah, the NHL uh, had these uh, games. They decided they were going to play – I think it was Saturday afternoon or something on uh, on the NHL Network or whatever NBC or whatever it was. Right, right, right. And this was one of the this was one of the early games uh, in that in that series so when the when they started to to play them on the the, the Saturdays or Saturdays or Sundays. But uh, this all happened actually. I was in the dressing room when when this all the benches cleared and and one of the uh, uh, security guards come in and goes, Larry, Larry, the, the, the bench was up clear. And I had my skates untied. 
and uh, I had gone in to get, I got hit with a stick. And so I had a small cut and the blood was running down into my eye. So they said, ah, there's not much time left on the, uh, the game. Why don't you just go in and get it, you know, get it fixed. So uh, here I am in there. So anyway, I'm coming out, stopped at the bench, tied my skates. And I, I went, I was one of the last ones on the ice and I'm just kind of looking, everybody's kind of paired up. And uh, so I see Schultz and Schultz looking for a partner. And all of a sudden he spots Lafleur, and he started towards Lafleur. So that's when I jumped in and went over and I grabbed him. I, I mean, I wasn't thinking of uh, fighting him at the time, but what happened was we just kind of grappled and were hanging on to each other. And then he kind of pulled me, uh, trying to headbutt me. And, and uh, my, I got my right uh, hand loose. So I said, well, if we're going to go, better go now. So, I just started swinging, and well, unfortunately, he, he, he was pretty good. He was a receiver. <laughs> well, you know, and, and you did make a point uh, out of that, but you know, uh, hockey writer Al Strachan uh, later said, you know, what's often overlooked in discussing uh, Larry Robinson is the fact that he was the best fighter in the NHL. Do you think he was thinking about you laying down the hammer and dropping the hammer? Well, you know what I mean. I didn't. I, I I fought early in my career, um, especially when we were in the minors. I mean, playing in the American League at, at the time that I was playing, it was nothing to have two and three bench clearing brawls a night. So uh, it was basically you you had to you had to fight or or uh, you'd get run out of the rink because it was there was a big intimidation factor back then. Uh, so you had to stand up for yourself, and then. Uh, later on, you know, when you're one of the bigger guys, you're looked upon to, uh, you know, to stick up for your stars. So um, they kind of looked at myself and and uh, Pierre Bouchard, I guess, a little bit to kind of look after the uh, the our so-called uh, better players. So I just kind of felt it, that that was kind of my job. I, I mean, I didn't go looking for it, but if I had to. Um, I was there and I was willing, willing to do whatever I had to do. Actually, my younger brother, Mo was, uh, he's a little bit smaller than me, but he grew up in kind of the same area. And, and so he was on the same team as Chris Nyland. So he had his share of bouts too, and he was pretty scrappy little kid. So I guess we learned it somewhere. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't remember getting in too many fights when I was young, but I guess you, you have to do what you got to do. Well, your value is as as a uh, an all star defenseman and Conn Smythe Trophy winner, and and uh, you know multiple you know uh, you know the Norris trophies. Your your value was 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 a little bit different than like, say a guy like Dave Schultz. But you know yeah. you, you show you guys showed you could handle yourselves in that game, and that yeah. that set the tone, and it, it did change the game because you know the Flyers were winning with intimidation, and it seemed like that was the way that the game was heading. But here was you guys, a team full of skill that showed you could stand up for yourselves if need be. And that, yeah. and that really changed the game. And Steve Schott actually said, you guys won the Stanley Cup that night. It just became official in May. <laughs> well, that's, that's quite a statement for Shuddy, because he wasn't one of the ones getting his, his butt kicked. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, in all, in all honesty, it was true. I mean, uh, the year that we uh, won the Stanley Cup, I think it was 76. Uh, we beat them four straight. And that, that was a time of uh, Kate Smith and all that kind of stuff. And and we truly did, I, I think, uh, personally felt that the whole league was kind of looking at, uh, to us, uh, you know, to change the tide, to uh, take away the intimidation factor and so on and so forth. But you, you have to give Philadelphia their uh, canoes as well because, uh, you know, they weren't just a bunch of bullies. They had some extremely really really good uh hockey players of course you got bernie perron and goal and uh you know ed van imp he was a solid defender billy barber and clarky and mcleish and and down the, down the line so i mean they had their their uh they're also their very very talented uh team as well but um you just had to, it's like any bully that that's in school if you don't stand up to them they're you know they're going to take advantage of you and and that's what we all we did is we we stood up for ourselves right and it wasn't just fighting uh, i want to talk about the body check that you threw on uh, gary dornhofer maybe the biggest body check in nhl history let's have a look at that one Vic. now this one this one here 
<laughs> that broke the boards. They actually had to physically come out and repair the boards. You can see the crack in it right there. Tell us about that. Yes. And <laughs> was that your best? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because I remember, I remember the hit and it was, it just, it kind of set up perfectly where Dorney was coming down, uh, of course, with his head, kind of his head down and he wasn't expecting me to come across. And uh, so when I, I made the hit, uh, it was just right after where the, the penalty box is. And there's a two by four that goes across that holds the boards. And I don't know, maybe it was cracked a little bit. But when I, uh, when I saw the, uh, the hit in later years, I went, holy mackerel. And you have to know the way, you have to know the, way the boards in the forum are. They, I mean, they don't give. And, these, and that, those boards actually bent and came back. So I think it was a lot harder to, than, uh, than I thought I hit him. But I saw Dorney in, in years after, and we were, I don't know how the conversation came up, but he goes, yeah, he says, uh, you know, I wanted to get up right away and not show you, you know, that you, that you hit me that hard. And he goes, that night I said, I, I went to the bathroom and I was spitting up blood. So I says, I think it hit me a little bit harder than I thought. So I said, well... <laughs> Uh, he, these are years after Dorney. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. And then we yeah. laughed. And, well, like the yeah, and he wouldn't have told you that at the time either. He would have said, no, no. I was fine. I was fine. I was fine. <laughs> you didn't hear me at all. Yeah. What? Yeah. But you guys had, had an amazing team, obviously. Uh, and we I summed up by, like this by your captain um, when uh, he was on the show just a, a little while ago. Let's pick that up. Uh, we have uh, the four best defensemen in the league. Mm. Uh, and we have Big three, Larry Robinson, Serge Chavar, Guy Lapointe. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we were Ken Dryden in the net. I mean, we were, we were a perfect team. So Yvonne said you were a perfect team. Would you, uh, would you agree with that assessment? Well, say we're a perfect team. I mean, if, if we were that perfect, then Scotty wouldn't have skated the crap out of us so much. But, I mean, when you think about when you think back, and uh, everybody uh, relates to the year that we only lost eight games. But if you look at the, those, the next two, uh, well, that year and the year following, we only lost 20 games in two years. And, uh, I mean, that's unheard of in, in, in any sport, in, in, uh, in any era. Uh, so I guess if, if you looked at it that way, I guess we were pretty close. We could, uh, we could play it anyway. I mean, we could skate. We could get into a scoring game we could get into a physical game uh not unlike i, I think the team that was probably closest to uh, the way that we were was was the team in the, the islanders when they had pod van they won their four in a row they had the, a very similar team to what we did in, in that they had they had some checkers but they had some scorers as well as well right but nobody racked up 132 points. Nobody lost just eight no. games. One at one on home ice. I think it was it was Hartford, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so yeah. 77, 76, 77. Uh, Scotty's coach of the year. Guy was Hart Trophy winner. Art Ross winner. Pearson winner. Uh, Shell was top scorer. Would have been the Richard Trophy if they if they had it back then. Ken Dryden won the Desna, and of course you had 19 goals. And 66 assists and was plus 120. Oh. To no one's surprise, you won the Norris Trophy. How special is that for you? Uh, I mean, I didn't. I didn't win the trophy. I, you know, I had great teammates. I played. I played um, on the same line as uh, Guy Lafleur and Steve Shutt and and Jock Lemaire or Pete Mahovlich, and and I had Serge Savard as my partner. I mean. Um, you know, those are five pretty darn good uh, players to be with. So um, uh, I, I think the only reason that I won it is because I, I did have a, a very successful offensive year, but you could have just as easily have given it to uh, Serge as well because uh, he covered up for a lot of my mistakes and allowed me uh, the freedom to do whatever uh, I wanted to do on the ice. So uh, it, was a pretty, uh, it was a pretty special time. I got to play with him. He was my roommate for seven years. and. Uh, uh, the only reason that I was able to win it was because of him. Well, it's pretty three pretty awesome defensemen. You and Serge and Lapointe all on the same team. Yep. That's, I don't think that's ever happened before. But uh, 77 78, uh, another Stanley Cup, your third in a row. This time in, in the playoffs, you got four goals, 17 assists in the playoffs, including 
a beauty, uh, Ray Hur. Heading to the net to clean up on a play that you started. And uh, how sweet was that goal? Uh, you know what? That, that was a, that was, it was an okay goal, but my favorite goal is the one where uh, I picked it up behind the net and, and uh, took it all the way down and then uh, give, uh, I think it was Mike Milbury, the inside outside and then cut in and put a top corner on uh on achievers that was one of my one of my favorites the the end to end but that that one was a, well, that one was special because it was a it was a big goal and uh and we uh and that was also right in boston and we know how important uh goals are are in in boston they're very far and few between but that was a that was a pretty special time as well well, we, we, we're we going to get to that goal in a little, but we might as well show it now. Yeah. Like, can you get that one queued up for that? was one that was the best goal, okay? And, and uh, so this is uh, – here, here we go. Here we go. This is you starting out behind your own net. One of the best goals you, we've ever seen. Yeah, there you go. Go ahead. That was usually how it, how it happened is because uh, I would start – I would start and uh, Serge would be behind the net. And uh, a lot of the times – if we were going out the right side, we would never pass it up to uh, with to Guy Lafleur's side because he was never there. So if if we were going up the the left side, we go to to Steve's shot because we knew Steve would, would be there. But uh, this one here was it just everything kind of fell into place because uh, I had the momentum and I kind of caught uh, um, Milbury a little bit flat footed. And uh, this is one time where your reach comes in handy and having long legs. So, but Cheesy uh, uh, kind of left early. So I was able to hit it, hit the short side with it. Well, that was pretty awesome. And, you know, you talked about that inside outside move on Millbury. And then look at the hand. So, I mean, forehand, uh, backhand to forehand and uh, upstairs on Cheevers. I mean, that was a goal scorer's goal, Larry. No doubt about it. Well, that's from my, uh, my forward days. I used to do that all the time when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> well, we missed a lot of that. What a, what a forward you could have been, my friend. Okay, so uh, let's talk about you won the Conn Smythe tro uh, Trophy. Conn Smythe Trophy. Um, Don Cherry said that that year you uh, single handedly uh, beat his Bruins. What do you think of what do you think of that assessment? Well, that, that's pretty kind of of uh, grapes, but yeah, <clears throat> you, you know that I always said, and even when I started uh, coaching, I said the same thing. I said. Uh, you know, good or great hockey players, you know, win uh, individual awards, but uh, teams win championships. And I trade all my individual awards for uh, for team championships because once you've won the cup once, there's nothing there's nothing like it than in the whole world. It's uh, it's a fantastic feeling, and uh, basically, it's like having cake and uh, and ice cream as well. So uh, uh, I'm very fortunate to have had both. You uh, mentioned in the book that playing in Montreal, it, it, it's, it can either make you or break you as a player. And you said playing in Montreal made you. It made you. The, it brought out the best in you. Uh, how so? Well, uh, you know, I, I think uh, as a player, uh, you're given challenges and you either rise to the challenges or you, you fold underneath them. And uh, we were challenged every year. I mean, we used to make a joke about it, and he says, "Okay, guys, here we are. Uh, every the, the you know the fans are behind us, win or tie, just don't tie too often." So uh, when when our when our sit when our season started, uh, that's the thing. We were we weren't just expected to win; we were expected to bring back a Stanley Cup. So um, it yeah, I think that's what made us all the players that we did because we were given a challenge. Uh, Scotty was a great mentor for all of us. Uh, sometimes we uh, didn't like him all that much, but he knew what he was doing. He, he kept his foot on the pedal. He knew when to take it off and when to apply the brake and, and, uh, when he had to, you know, put your foot down and get going. And, and he just knew the guys and, and uh, probably was one of the best coach bosses, uh, behind the bench that I have ever witnessed in, in my playing time. Uh, he knew 
uh, all the buttons to to push. Uh, he knew who to put on the ice at uh, at at the right time, and uh, he he basically gave us all the confidence to to become better players. And and that's what it was like to play in Montreal. Uh, you know, they the the fans they were great. They were behind us, no doubt about it. But uh, they they wanted us to be at our best. So if you gave your best, uh, they loved you. If you didn't give your best, then uh, you deserve to be uh, to be booed or uh, to be scolded or whatever. So uh, with that 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 pressure is is what I grew up with. Um, the way that I learned how to play sports, the way I put, I didn't have to have anybody put pressure on me. I put pressure on myself. I always wanted to be the best. Some people can handle that pressure. Some people can't. And you talk about yeah. mentors. You talk about Scotty being a mentor. You talk about the mentors you had, but you were also a mentor mentor for other players. We had Chris Nyland on the show uh, a few months back, and he talked about playing with Larry Robinson. Now Larry Robinson puts it right on the tape. Springer for a breakaway. Here's that patent move deep to the backhand. There we go. Now tell me, yeah. we talked, we touched on Larry earlier. How how good was Big Bird? Oh, God. You know, I remember the first time I saw him. I snuck into the Boston Garden with my friends and the Montreal game, obviously. And Larry just kind of came on the scene. I forget, what, what year did he come in? Seven? I'm going to say 71, right when they, before they started the uh, the big run. Yeah. Yeah. And we had snuck in it. And he came, he grabbed the puck behind the net and took off up the ice. And I'm like, man, this guy is big. And he skated tr through everybody in the, in the neutral zone and wound up and took a slapper and ended up scoring. And I'm like, who the hell have they got now? Who is this guy? And that was the first time I ever saw Larry Robinson. But he was just, he had so much range, hockey sense. Um, he was just an awesome guy, too. Just an awesome teammate and fun to be around. And, um, you know, like I said, he was getting over there as, as I was there, but he had such a great impact on the young defenseman who came in there, he, he, he helped Chelly's, Svoboda, all of them. Like, he was really, Mike Lawler, he really worked with guys and, and never had that attitude that I'm the man. It wasn't Larry, but he was the man. <laughs> yeah, he was the man. How did Big Bird come about? Uh, it, was, it was during the, uh, the Flyer series. Um, you know, they, cause, uh, the flyers all had, uh, nicknames for all their players. Like, the uh, Bob, Bob Kelly had uh, a nickname, uh, uh, Selesky. uh, they called him big bird. And I guess Serge said, wow, Selesky, big bird. We've got our own big bird. We got big bird, Larry Robinson, because we both had the same kind of hair or whatever. And so that's where it first started. And that's where it kind of stuck was. So oh, I, I can blame Serge prior to that one. You, uh, you mentioned in the book that the 86 Cup was special. Why is that? Well, because, you know, we had gone uh, quite a few years uh, and had been close. But, uh, there, you know, it was kind of the, I was kind of getting to the end of my career. And I knew that I wasn't going to get very many chances. And then we made a trade uh, about halfway through the year and, and uh, got uh, uh, Rick Green um, in the trade and then uh, Ryan Walter. And they just kind of uh, gelled with us. They're both great teammates. Uh, in fact, Rick and I have been friends for, seems like forever, like 30 years. We just hung out together and, and did a lot of things together. And he was my roommate actually during the 86, uh, 86 run, but uh, we just, we kind of got on a roll and, and I remember, uh, this one meeting that we had, um, and it was, uh, Bobby Smith, uh, I, I, I think it was Peron that had said, you know, like he got us all together and, um, he said, you know, has anybody got anything to say? And of course, Bob Ganey, he got up and said something, but I remember exclu exclusively that this, this one 
thing that Bobby Smith said that, that kind of hit home for everybody. And he was talking about the story about when he was with uh, Minnesota uh, before he got traded to Montreal. And they had a really, really good team and they made a great run for it. Uh, and they ended up losing in the finals. And uh, they all got together and said, oh, you know what? This is a good run. We're, you know, we're right close. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll do it again next year. And he goes, he goes, but it never happened next year. But, you know, uh, so you have to take advantage of the opportunity that you're given. And, um, and, and that's kind of what we did. And, and, and looking back on it now, Joe, it's kind of funny because I thought that uh, uh, Calgary had a much better team than we did in 1986. And yet we won in Calgary. And then in 1989, I thought we were the better team in 1989. And yet turns around Calgary won it. So uh, it's just, it's, it's funny how the playoff goes. And, and, and that's one, one of the hard things about uh, winning the Stanley Cup is that you just, you just never know. I mean, you could have the best team, uh, you could have the best goalie, but if you don't have a little bit of luck along the way and if things don't necessarily go your way, uh, you, you, you might not win, even though you're the best team. So um, they say it's one of the hardest trophies to win, and I, and I truly believe that because you could be the best and still not win. You played a lot of great international games. You guys played in the 1975 uh, New Year's Eve game against the Russians, which some people have called the, one of the greatest hockey games ever played. Uh, you played uh, against the Red Army. You played uh, you know, Canada Cup with Bobby Orr. You played uh, a couple more Canada Cup experiences. And you talked about... Um, you know, motivational speeches uh, like Bobby Smith before before the Cup win. Let's talk about your motivational actions uh, in 1984 at the Canada Cup uh, with your flash dance routine. <laughs> uh, well, it doesn't come ac- it doesn't come across quite as funny. Uh, it was uh, Peter Miller. Uh, Peter Miller was the trainer at the time, and. Uh, uh, we had, ju- I think we had just lost the game before. I don't know if it was against Sweden or, or whatever it was. And, and it, it was funny because that year was kind of, there was kind of a mixture. There was, we had a little bit of the Oilers and a little bit of the Islanders and the, the two, the, there was a little bit of animosity, uh, I would say between everybody. So I just, I just felt that, you know, it was a group. Uh, that were we, we were playing up tight. We were supposed to be there. We're having we're supposed to have fun doing this, um, even though there's a lot of pressure on you because you are playing for your your country. But uh, I just I just I don't know why I did it, but uh, for some reason, anyway, they they uh, I got Peter Miller to play the the flash dance. And if you remember in flash dance, there was the, right at the end when she goes to uh, to try out. Uh, for at, in front of all these judges, she does this thing where she goes running down uh, and jumps yeah. up in the air and, and lands down. Well, I did the same thing, but I was I was in my uh, uh, all I had on was a uh, inner jock and uh, and a pair of socks. So uh, the guys, it, it was just a, it was a thing just to loosen the guys up, and we went on to. I, th- I think we we won that game like. I don't know, by four or five goals. So, of course, well, I did it once. So now that was kind of the thing before every game. They're here. As soon as they heard the song, they would be looking around, looking for me. And here I'd come run down to the, the dressing room with my gotchas on. But uh, I, I, I talk about it to this day to Peter Miller. And Peter Miller still, he just starts to cry laughing so hard. So it, it was just a spur of the moment thing that I did. One of the craziest things I do. Uh, but it just seemed to uh, bring everybody together and loosen everybody up a little bit. Right, and there was the, the more serious conversation with you. You had at, at the guys at you know, somebody Sam's, I believe, in, in Calgary, uh, when you when kind of laid down the line and said, and, you know, stop the finger pointing, stop the you and this, you and that. So let's let's just get together and do this, you know, together. And that was a pretty significant thing, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. again, you know, it, it was just a, a continuation of uh, you know what had happened before the, the thing that I did in the dressing room was, was kind of, you know, like a, a private thing and, and a spur of the moment thing. But, um, 
you know, when I talked to him, I said, listen, you know, you know, we're, we're, we're all sacrificing for the same thing. I mean, we're, we all, we all uh, gave up our summers and, uh, and our training and everything to be here to represent our country. And uh, the only way that uh, we're going to play and we're going to win, uh, I said, look, look at the, look at you. The, I was pointing to the Oilers. I said, you guys are all, all played together. Same with the uh, Islanders. We all played together. The, you won. You didn't win because you were fighting amongst each other or pointing fingers against each other. You're here as, as a family, and uh, you 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 when you pull a wagon together, it's a lot easier than if you've got somebody pulling one way and somebody pulling the other way. So uh, it it just it again it, it was a kind of a spur of the moment thing. And I, I, after all, I was one of the captains on, on the team, so I just felt in my my uh, my place and my my duty to to do whatever we. Had. We could to uh, try to win the, the tournament. Well, it worked. You guys won the Canada Cup, and about yeah. that time, you guys uh, you made you made a commercial spot, and we have a, a clip from that, uh, Vic. If you can roll that. <laughs> North America's only six-passenger front-wheel drive wagon is a Chrysler K car, named Motor Trends Car of the Year. Heads up, best gas economy of any sex hockey player car. <laughs> okay, there we are. You and Podfan and Lanny and Sittler and Dion. I, I, I'm guessing the Chrysler played a uh, paid a pretty penny to have all you guys in the same commercial spot. Are you well, maybe nowadays, but back then, <laughs> kidding. They probably gave, they probably gave us the hockey bags after we were finished. But I, I think we I think we did that. Uh, I think we did that uh, commercial at about I think it was five or six o'clock in the morning because it was a, a oh, like an early morning early morning shoot so not only were did we have to do the tournament or do the uh, commercial but we had to get up at about four o'clock in the morning to go to out somewhere out around the uh, airport to do it yeah and so you all go back your your separate ways uh, at the end of the uh, of uh, that last canada cup and and you go back to montreal and and uh you know you, you win the end of win the cup after that and then uh, but eventually you left montreal how hard was it to leave uh, to leave the club Oh, at the time, I, I mean, it was kind of, it was kind of, a, again, I was kind of at the end of my career and like, you know, you can, I mean, you have to, you kind of know that you're not the, the, the same player that you once were, but it just happened. It just happened by accident. Um, you know, I had, uh, I was right near the end of my contract. Uh, so uh, Serge was the, the general manager at the time and he offered me a one-year contract. And so my uh, my question to them was, well, you know, what if I want to play more? I mean, uh, can I not sign a three year? And if I don't play, then, you know, that'd be it. No, he said, no, all we're willing to sign you for is for one year. And I said, well, let me think about it. So I went back to, at the time I owned a, a Corvette specialist shop and with a friend of mine, Donnie Cape. And so we were sitting there and we're talking. I, he goes, well, why don't you try like, you know, want to try something else. So we said, well, okay, whatever. So we ended up calling Bruce McNall. And uh, so we got Bruce McNall on the phone. We're talking to him. He goes, hi, hey, Larry, how you doing? Yeah, come on out. Uh, I'll fly you out and uh, let's, let's, let's see what happens. And so I said, well, wh what are you willing to offer? And he goes, well, I'll, I'll offer you three years. And if you decide you don't want to play the third year, I'll still pay you half your salary. I said, whoa. That's a pretty good deal. So anyway, we, my wife and I got into the, uh, the plane with uh, Donnie Cape and his wife, and we went out and, and got the tour around with uh, Bruce McNall and went on the Pat Sajak show and this and that. And mm -hmm. so we went back. So we, yeah. so we went back to uh, Bruce's office, and uh, we called Serge up and said, uh, well, because so, uh, we had to give them the first rate of refusal or whatever it is. Uh, at the time. So uh, we called Serge and he goes, uh, this is what we were offered. Um, will you match the offer? And they said, no, uh, we, we can't match the offer. And so I said, well, then I'm going to sign in, uh, in LA. And that's how I ended up in Los Angeles. Well, they, they treated pretty well in LA and they've treated pretty well when you return to Montreal. We uh, have a clip yeah. from, from that, that moment. Here we go. And to my son, good luck. I love you too. 
and to all of you, merci Montréal, je t'aime. Pretty special night by a classy organization, Larry. Yeah, it was it was a great night. Um, it, it's uh, it's pro that was probably the hardest thing is to go back and, and play in the uh, the same arena where you uh, basically made made your career and and had so many great moments. Uh, but again, it's it, it, as it turned out, it was a it was a great opportunity for me because uh, not only did I play get to play there for three years, but uh, I got to end up going back and and uh, coaching there for four years. So um, it 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 not only gave me a good end of my career, uh, but it also gave me a good after career uh, opportunity as well. Well, you talked about coaching uh, after a bit of a slow start in L.A. Things really took off when you moved to to Jersey. Uh, Scott Niedermeyer said that you know having you on the coaching staff really helped make uh, him make his his career it was it was perfect fit for him. He yeah. said uh, he said you loved the game and uh, you loved life. Is that pretty much it in a nutshell? Well, again, you know, I, I mean, I had I had learned I learned a lot from a lot of great players along my the course of my career, uh, and and I always thought that. Uh, uh, you, it, the pressure that you put on yourself <clears throat> is sometimes greater than the, the, the pressure that's put on you uh, from your surroundings. So I tried to keep it as light as I could uh, for these players. And, and I didn't, uh, it wasn't my job uh, because I was an assistant uh, uh, coach at the time. So it wasn't my job uh, with Lemaire. I was the kind of the smoother. Uh, Lemaire was the guy that, uh, you know, put the knife in, and I was the guy that went in and stitched it up and and uh, tried to heal it. So um, I I took uh, Scotty Niedermeyer on a lot of uh, I guess lunch lunches and uh, talked to him and uh, tried to uh, mentor him as much as I could. Um, but uh, I just tried to pass on my experiences that I had and what I didn't try to change anybody, but I. Uh, I tried to uh, make it as easy as possible for them uh, to become uh, better players as well. Because don't forget, I, I was a rookie at this this job too. So I was uh, learning firsthand from a pretty good uh, coach in, in Jacques Lemaire. And I also had a, a pretty good mentor in uh, Lou Lamarillo, who uh, gave me the opportunity to go there. So uh, it was a, it was a fun experience. Uh, I learned a lot, and it also uh, was a great springboard for me for my uh, future career in coaching as well. In 1995, you're inducted into the into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Uh, not a, not the least bit of a surprise there. And then in 2007, uh, you had your jersey retired by uh, Montreal in, in an incredible ceremony. Um, here's a great. Uh, Dick Irvin with the announcement. He is without question not only one of the greatest defensemen in Canadians history, but one of the greatest defensemen the game of hockey has ever seen. The Canadians record holder for goals, assists, points, and games played by a defenseman. So it's time to bring him out. Here he is, accompanied by his grandson Dylan, number 19, Larry Robinson. So very cool to be there with your grandson. All the players wearing number 19. Jean Beliveau and Guy Lafleur were, were still with us. They were there, of course. What was going through your mind when, when all this was happening? <laughs> I, was, I was as nervous as heck. I knew I still had to make a speech. and uh, I'm kind of an emo emotional person to start with. Uh, so I was trying to, get, trying to get through all this, but I'm laughing because... Uh, I see Dylan now, uh, or actually then, and and now we uh, we're looking at each other eye to eye. He just turned twenty huh. twenty two, and he's uh, he's likes to get into the gym and lift weights, so he's about three times the size that I was. So, uh, but it was a great it was it was a great it was a great moment. Uh, it was something that uh, I'll cherish for the rest of my life, and 
it's it's great now because all the, the kids and my grandkids uh, can go back to uh, the Bell Center now and be able to see uh, my sweater up in the bathroom. It's funny because the, the, the guys uh, from St. Louis gave me a call uh, last week when they were in town and uh, <clears throat> they said, oh, there's some big guy here wearing number 19. So they uh, they sent me a video and it was uh, my... Uh, my no, uh, number up in the rafters. So uh, it was, again, it was a pretty special moment. That's my friend. Yes, Don you're still, there. right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> you, and you, you, I mean, they, they brought you back for encore after encore after encore. So yeah. it was amazing. It was amazing. There. Yeah. Fun night. It was a fun night. Yeah. They no do. question about that. And, I was going to say that they they know how to do it right. They're, it was a uh, it was great. The only the only thing missing was my good friend uh, Claude Mouton. We lost her earlier to cancer, and uh, but uh, a lot of really really good friends that were there. You know, you mentioned you're still involved with the uh, with the blues organization. I believe as uh, as a uh, uh, consultant. Well, I, I I've been. Uh, I've been a free agent now for for uh, two years. Um, uh, I haven't. I didn't go back after we won the cup. Um, they decided to uh, go different ways, and I, I I wasn't sure whether I wanted to go back because there was a long it was a long haul, and it was it was hard on uh, on myself and my wife because we we checked into the hotel in in St. Louis on the seventh of April, I think it was. And we checked out on the 23rd of June. So it's a long time to play in the, or to, to be in a hotel and the traveling and everything else. But what what a incredible, incredible uh, journey that was uh, from from where I was when we first started uh, to going behind the bench uh, to going back to being a consultant and so on and so forth. It was uh, it was truly, truly unbelievable. The St. Louis people are the nicest, nicest, nicest people that uh, I've gotten to meet in my career. One last question, and I have to ask you this because, uh, you know, watching what the Habs are going through right now, what do they need to do to get this uh, shift turned around? Well, it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a difficult uh, for any team uh, that um, not necessarily got behind, but they – they got into a little bit of a rut and um, and went didn't make the playoffs for a number of years and they really haven't had a lot of uh, you know great picks that have have come and uh, are, are part of their club right now. There's no real centerpiece now. They have you know Caulfield and uh, Suzuki and uh, they've got a couple of good young uh, defensemen. Um, so it, it's been a it's been a very trying time for them. And uh, I think the, the point where they're at right now is that they, they have to get to, into a rebuilding where they can get themselves a real seven, eight to 10 guy nucleus that they can depend on every night. And they're, they're getting there. Are they there yet? I don't think so. Uh, I still think that they, uh, they need a few more pieces, but it's tough in today's, uh, today's game that uh, once you, uh, once you start to lose that edge and and uh, you uh, lose key players, it's it's tough to get them back. Maybe a Connor Bedard draft pick might help a little bit. I think that would be a good start, a very good start. Although, <laughs> although, uh, having said that, Joe, uh, he's he's a great he's a great player, uh, but I I think it, uh, in order to uh, have success in the league you you have to have a guy like a like a mcdavid or a mckinnon somebody that uh, can withstand uh the rigors of uh of the game you know with either you have a, a, enough speed and skill that you don't get hit or you have enough uh skill and size that you you can uh, uh, withstand the physicality because it's it's a tough game right now and uh you just look at the injuries throughout the league, and right, even right now, uh, you know the Habs lost Caulfield for the year. Um, it's uh, you've you've got to have 
you got to have a lot of depth and you got to have uh, players that can uh, withstand the rigors of uh, playing four and five times a week. Right. Well, the Leafs are hoping here in Toronto that they, they have uh, that in Austin Matthews too. Uh, yeah. Larry, I want to thank you, thank you for taking the time to join us. It's been awesome. It's been uh, you know one of my favorites for sure. No question. Going going back through memory lane and, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, more sports when we come back. Addiction Rehab Toronto, Toronto's number one alcohol and drug treatment center, saving lives, reuniting families. The only treatment center in the province to offer medical detox, treatment, sober living, and lifetime aftercare all in one place. Our unique and specialized programs are designed to equip our clients with the tools to successfully lead a life of dignity, respect, and purpose. Let us help save your life or your loved one's life. Call today for more information or to facilitate an intervention. 1-855-787-2424 or visit addictionrehabtoronto.ca. Visit moregolf.ca. You'll find everything a golfer could need from balls, gloves, clubs, custom fitting opportunities, training gear, valuable accessories, and some great deals. Looking for that perfect gift idea for the golfer in your life? Go to moregolf.ca today. Joe Tilly Sports is brought to you by COSA, Central Ontario Standard Bread Association, providing a united voice for harness horse people racing at Ontario tracks. Check out your benefits today at COSAonline.com and check out COSA TV on Facebook and YouTube for all the latest harness news and live action updates. Live racing year-round. Go to HPIBet.com for all your wagering options. Become a member today and your first bet is free. That's HPIBet.com. All right, my Costa Swiss pick of the week. Last time on, I picked Barzi in the eighth race of Mohawk. No doubt she would have got the job done, but the race was scrapped due to heavy fog at the Campbellville track. This is what the second race of the card looked like. Tough to call a race like that for announcer Ken Middleton. 20 to 1 shot, Sunshine Sally would go on to win this race at 154 and 2. John Drury, the driver, trained by Carmen Osiello. The 7610 trifecta returned $1,236.20, and the card was canceled after that race. This week, well, let's try it again. For the third week in a row, I'm going with Barzi. This time, she's the number five horse in the fifth race. Bob McClure drives. I'm also taking the 456 exacta and trifecta box. For all the racing updates, visit Cosa TV on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Go to hpibet.com for your wagering options. This is the Excellent Sports Adventure. Brought to you by Lycom. The top two Canadian-based teams squared off this week. Jets and Leafs in Toronto. Uh, Leafs rush, Michael Bunting digs in. Sends a sweet feed in front for Austin Matthews. AM34 is going to rip that bar down. His second of the night, 24th of the season. Lease handle Winnipeg 4-1. to one. Now, the Leafs have caught fire at home. Just one loss in their last 17 games at Scotiabank Arena. William Nylander with his second of the game. A four-point night for Willie as the Leafs dump the Islanders 5-2. to two. In Bruce Boudreaux's final game as Canucks head coach, Zach Hyman had a heck of a night. Long lead feed to Connor McDavid over to Hyman, who had a goal and three helpers. Oil take it 4-2. The Canucks replaced Boudreaux with Rick Tockett, who has his work cut out for him. Johnny Goudreau made his return to Calgary. Johnny Hockey was on the ice in overtime, but Andrew Mangiapane slid a perfect feed over to Dylan Dubé. Dubé. A perfectly placed shot. Flames over Goudreau's Blue Jackets, 4-3. to three. Well, things are going well for the Maple Leafs on the farm. The Marlies have rung up eight straight wins. Power play, Nick Eberzizi in front of uh, Logan Shaw for the lovely redirect. The Marlies handled Belleville, 4-3. Joseph Wall stopped 29 shots 
as he improves to 11-0 on the season. That, by the way, is a club record. Well, the Raptors have hit the road for a couple of weeks. A seven-game swing that starts in Sacramento. This week, Knicks in town. R.J. Barrett puts up a three. Pascal Siakam with the block. And Spicy P gets down the floor to hurry for the finish. O.G. Ananobi gives to Gary Trent Jr. for the nasty slam. Trent Jr. also had 24. Fred Van Vliet with 28. He's back. Wraps over the over the next 125 to 116. You know, it's always interesting when the Raptors and Bucks get together. A scuffle broke out this week when Brooke Lopez got into it with Gary Trent Jr. Lopez walked Trent down toward the baseline, grabbed his headband off his head. At that point, multiple players from both teams got involved along with coaches, various security personnel. Cooler heads, of course, would prevail, but Lopez was tossed from the game. The Bucks eventually won the game. The Toronto Rock, well, they're on a pretty good roll. Looking for their third straight win with the Rock moseyed into Philadelphia where they manhandled the wings. Tempers would flare. For the second straight game, Tom Schreiber scored five times and helped set up a couple more. The Rock went at 14-5, which included a 13-0 run. Nick Rose stopped 45 shots. Rock improved to 4-2 there in Calgary this week. What a way to start the LPGA season for Brooke Henderson of Canada. Yes, indeed. The 25-year-old from Smith Falls went wire to wire in capturing the Hilton Grand Vacations Tournament of Champions. She finished at 16 under, good for a four-shot win, and it was her 13th tour victory. Way to go, Brooke. And now it's time for our shot of the week. God damn it. Four! Today's environmental tip, use less electricity. Power plants release harmful chemicals, including greenhouse gases. The process of extracting fossil fuels from the earth destroys natural habitats. Water usage to provide steam and cooling contributes to water shortages. RICOM, passionate people who turn complicated business problems into simplified technology solutions. For public and private sector real estate, properties, portfolios, and enterprise customers. Optimize and future-proof smart buildings from the ground up. The latest in fault locating, base building network design, managed services, cybersecurity, data analytics. Our fault detection will support all smart strategies, define projected outcomes for capital planning, and reduce environmental impact. RICOM, smart protection solutions, at RICOM, we're building a path to a smart and environmentally friendly future. And we want to thank all the folks who make this show possible. These are friends, trusted business associates, and all around great people. We thank them all for their support of Canadian and local sports. A reminder that the show is available on Spotify, iTunes, uh, all Radio Public, Google Podcasts, Breaker, as well as the Spanglish Network, Zingo TV and Buzz TV Live. Also, you really want to check out our YouTube channel. There are past shows available, weekly sportscasts, all kinds of cool statements. Like and subscribe to the show. It's absolutely free. And thanks once again to Larry Robinson for being on the show. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show is brought to you by... Do you want to buy or sell a home? Could 31 years of real estate experience help you? Why not speak to an amazing team that loves to overpromise and overdeliver? Aldo has a tremendous team of experts on staff. They are committed to making your next real estate transaction smooth and comfortable. Call 416 Get Aldo or visit getaldo.com. Brian Gribben Insurance Planning, helping you solidify your financial future. At BGIP, what we do that's unique in the marketplace is we show people how to spend and enjoy their money in their early years of retirement 
without the fear of running out. Also, we're able to do this without you having to change financial advisors. Please look us up at bgip.ca today. Let's book a 30-minute phone call to see how we can bring value to you and your family in your planning. Call Brian today for all your retirement needs. We did. 905-686-5678. Guests on Joe Tilly Sports receive a gift certificate from Classica Imports. Top of the line, imported men's clothing. Check out the Classica Essential Collection now. Go to shopclassica.com. MNP, a leading Canadian national accounting, tax, and business accounting firm. MNP proudly serves and responds to the need of their clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Through partner led engagements, MNP provides a collaborative, cost effective approach to do business and personal strategies to help people and organizations to succeed across the country and around the world. With local offices in Oshawa, Mississauga, Burlington, and more. Their team is here to support you. Visit mnp.ca today to learn more.